Hello everyone and welcome to Bytown Lumberjack. You may recall previously I made a brief video on the trial version that was available on PC, but the full version was only available on Xbox Live Indie Games, and we're playing the full version right now. That is because for the express purpose of saving a few Xbox Live Indie Games that I thought were worth saving, I scrounged up enough money to purchase an Xbox 360 that smells of smoke, uh has cigarette ash in the power adapter, and a uh, controller that kind of works. But I obtained an Xbox 360 and 18 Xblade games that I thought looked good, that I thought were worth saving, to see what they were actually like, because there is no full footage of those titles anywhere. So we're gonna see how that pans out. These Xbox Live Indie Game Let's Plays are going to be released in sets of three, which will come out to a total of six sets, and the first game of the first set is, obviously, Bytown Lumberjack. I am going to be completing all of the games, assuming they can be completed, and my commentary style is going to remain the same as it always has, post-commentary and focused on being informative. But now onto the game itself. As you might have been able to tell from what little you've seen so far, Bytown Lumberjack is a traditional side-scrolling beat-em-up, the mechanics are exceedingly simple, perhaps one of the most simple beat-em-ups I've ever played, period. Even beat-em-ups with a single attack button generally have more depth. Anyway, we have a light swing, which is faster, and we have a heavy downward swing, which deals more damage, but is less fast. We're basically just going to be using the light swing all the time, because it stunlocks enemies. The heavy swing, not so good for stunlocking. We've already encountered the most basic enemy, which would be the raccoons. They take two light swings to go down, and it's really satisfying to kill them thanks to the sound effect and the gory way they expire, but I wouldn't call them challenging. Then there are these human enemies, which are basically just the raccoons, except they take three hits instead of two. They may actually be a little less threatening than the raccoons, because they're much easier to hit. They have a larger hitbox, you see. And I wish I could offer you some kind of strategy here, but I think it would be an insult to try. You're seeing what I'm doing here, I'm walking forward and smashing the, uh, the light attack button. This raccoon actually managed to hit me a couple of times because his hitbox is tinier, as I said. But that could have easily been solved if I just kept walking forward. So yeah, just keep moving forward and smashing a light attack, I guess. That's all the enemies so far are for. But up ahead, there is a new enemy type. This one throws projectiles. He throws rocks at us. Do you want to know how to deal with them? Walk straight forward and smash the light attack button. Now, you might think, if you've seen me play beat-em-ups before, that I should try and move around the thrown rock. But he throws it too quickly, and we don't move fast enough. The rocks basically home in on you. Believe me when I say that if we were actually trying to avoid the rocks, we would actually be dead right now instead of just almost dead. So if you want to win against the rock throwing enemies, you do have to charge straight in and smash the light attack button. After they've started their rock throwing animation, there's really nothing you can do about it either. It, it's going to launch the rock at you no matter how quickly you kill them at that point. So the best thing you can do is annihilate them. They don't really have a cooldown for throwing rocks, either. They just throw a new one as soon as they're done. So, I know it looks stupid, but this is actually the best strategy. I say strategy when so far all we've been doing is mashing basic attack, but up here there is an enemy that will actually require us to do something. In order to get around these porcupines, we need to bait them, and then move up or down to avoid their charge. Now, the downside to this is that sometimes their hitbox behaves in a way that it shouldn't, and we take damage when we shouldn't. I realize that perspective is difficult with games like this, but... Yeah, there's no way that should have hurt me. Like I said, I do understand perspective in these games is difficult, but damage should not be dealt dependent on whether the art overlaps. It should be dealt dependent on whether the enemy is on the same plane as I am, and those porcupines definitely were not on the same plane as me. So because of an oversight in the design with the porcupines, it's best to dodge beneath them than above them, so when you're baiting them, make sure to take that in mind. Here's another new enemy type again, the wolves, and the wolves do weird stuff to our character. They have this weird glitch where they shove our character around, like that, and it makes it really difficult to aim, and it's honestly incredibly frustrating. 
It doesn't matter if you're holding the control stick to the right or tapping it to the right or what, if the wolves bump against you, they'll force you to face left, which means you'll be swinging in the wrong direction, which is very frustrating. In addition to the new wolf enemies, we have these traps that we need to avoid or else we'll uh, get a penalty of 10 damage. It's generally easy enough to walk around- see what I mean with the wolves? Really frustrating. It's generally easy enough to walk around them. The, uh, the Lumberjack is a little bit slippery when he switches planes, when he moves up and down, but you don't need to do a lot of that in this game. And the traps are usually spread out far enough that it's not a big concern. What is a big concern is losing a level because of that, uh, that glitch with the wolf movement I mentioned. That would be very frustrating. Because of that glitch, sometimes it's a better idea to use the heavy attack to kill the wolves in a single hit. So it is true that we're using something other than a light attack now, but I refuse to count this as part of the game design because we're using it to overcome a glitch, you know? We're overcoming a flaw in the game's programming with it, so I don't think it should count as a positive. I suppose it technically adds variety, but I don't want to give the game praise for something like this. This level introduces us to yet another hazard, barrels. Thankfully, the barrels don't hurt us when the art overlaps, unlike the uh, sprites for the porcupines. Maybe the porcupines should learn something from those barrels. Anyway, we have just enough time to move around the barrels if you want to do that, or we have just enough time to smash them. I prefer to smash them because it's slightly more satisfying, but it doesn't really matter which you choose. I can't help but notice that this level is called Sonic the Porcupine, even though it's the level where they introduce the barrels and not the level where they introduce the porcupine enemy. I feel like that, that level name could have been used better a bit earlier, you know? J just, a, just a suggestion. These barrels look like they came straight out of RPG Maker, they don't really fit the art style. The art style is gorgeous, by the way, I wish the game design were as pretty. Not that the game is offensively bad or anything, if it weren't for the programming issues I would say it would be overwhelmingly average, but it does have programming issues which make it mediocre instead. And you know, that's a little bit disappointing. When I played the trial of Bytown Lumberjack, I knew it wasn't going to be outstanding, I expected it to be a very average game, but I still expected myself to enjoy it regardless of its, uh, its average quality. But with the programming issues, it becomes a little bit harder to enjoy, so not only is it, uh, mediocre as a result, but I'm getting mediocre enjoyment out of it. And even though I knew that it was going to be average, the optimist in me hoped it would be above average because I could see the game design getting more complicated, potentially. With these upgrades, we can choose from an extra life, 10 more HP, or extra speed. None of those are important, the game is not difficult enough to warrant any of them. Anyway, even though I was sure the game would turn out to be incredibly average, I still had that optimistic hope that it would turn out to be, you know, something greater than that. And I had the failsafe, you know, the good old failsafe. Even if it is incredibly average, I still really enjoyed the trial, so I would surely enjoy the full game just as much. But then it turned out to be incredibly mediocre and have a few bugs that really hamper the enjoyment. So I was incredibly disappointed. But like it or not, because of my optimism, uh, this is one of the 18 games I decided to save from Xbox Live Indie Games before the service goes down in September. You know, I see the enemies getting mixed together like this, and part of me thinks like, oh yeah, this is a thing good beat-em-ups do, but the substance just isn't there. And then there's these goddamn wolves that keep turning my character around. The game also goes on too long for its own good. It should have been, like, half as long. Now, I realize you want your game to be of substantial length, right? But when you run out of ideas so hard that things like, uh, like this upcoming section happen, right here, where it's just a long trail of people, like this, when you run out of game design so hard that you have to resort to shit like this, your game has gone on too long. And that kind of thing would be more forgivable if the game didn't even pretend to have some semblance of challenge. If the game just wanted to be a straight up button masher, it could do that. You know? The, the hitting is decently satisfying. The game should still be only half as long. Maybe less than half as long in that case. But because it mixes this mindless button mashing with slightly less mindless button mashing, it just... 
It makes the whole experience feel that much worse. This is not, not really enjoyable. This is by far the hardest level in the game, by the way. Definitely. But the problem is that although the enemies are being mixed up in an interesting fashion, you end up just having to button mash. Because the rock throwing enemies can only be dealt with by charging straight forward and button mashing. Which means you have to deal with the porcupines just by uh, just by tanking their hits. We definitely could have gotten through that section a lot better, don't get me wrong. But I was kind of wearing out on energy at this point. Anyway, the shield enemies. We need to use a heavy attack to break their shields and then just wail on them with a light attack. Like the barrels, the design of the shield enemies actually works, and I don't have to add a butt to that. The design for the shield enemies works as intended, and there are no programming glitches involved. But I find the shield enemy just illustrates the problem further that the game can't decide between being mindless and being slightly challenging. Like, you have to barely think, not enough to actually justify turning your brain on, but just enough to frustrate you that it's making you. You know, there were a few times while I was recording this, uh, recording this that I said to myself, at least, it's not Power Rangers Mega Battle. And you might think, well that's good, you'd rather be playing this than Power Rangers Mega Battle, but think about that. I had to compare this game to Power Rangers Mega Battle, that's how fucking dull it is. And it's not like I don't want to enjoy this, you know, that's why I bought it. I thought I would enjoy it, I thought it would be interesting, I thought it would be in enjoyable and fun, and... That's why I bought all the x -Blade games you're going to see, because I thought they would be enjoyable or interesting or good. I bought them all in good faith, you know? No ironic purchases. Anyway, no now that we're done with that rant, uh, you may notice that in addition to the programming problems, there are some technical issues. I have the game's volume turned down really far, but the music actually has severe audio clipping problems. Uh, when I first played this game, when I first beat it on the Xbox 360, the audio clipping was so bad that sometimes it cut out entirely. And when you get the chainsaw, it only gets worse. I firmly believe that unless you're playing a rhythm game, the soundtrack doesn't actually affect the quality of the gameplay. The gameplay is its own thing, separate from the music. But music absolutely affects enjoyment, and while enjoyment is not the same thing as quality, my enjoyment was even further hampered because the music was so screwed up. And what makes this even worse is that the music is actually high quality music. It's really energetic, fast paced, and aggressive, like the like the titular character. But I couldn't enjoy it because I can't listen to the song without it clipping into itself thanks to the chainsaw. Alright, so we're over halfway through the game. We have the chainsaw, our second weapon, which deals double damage. If you know anything about pacing and game design progression, you might figure that things should be getting quite a bit more difficult around now. I love in an arcade style game when level 11 isn't even half as difficult as level 9, it makes me feel like I'm really going somewhere. There will be a new enemy type in a moment and you don't get any points for guessing how we deal with him. Let's say something positive about the game though, I like that the force gets darker as you move further in. Because even though the game design doesn't really give you the hint that you're progressing all that much, at least the, uh, the environment does. That was the new enemy type back there, by the way. Here he is again. In case you're wondering why he's a new enemy type, why he's any different from the other humans we've seen so far, uh, he deals, I believe it's 15 damage with one swing. 
But it's it's really easy to stunlock him so he never gets a chance to do that. There are so many countless ways in which you could have made this game less dull. You could have made all the enemies like the shield enemies, give them a unique uh, a unique approach required to defeat them, like a puzzle, you know, like the other beat em ups I like. You could have created a compelling story and atmosphere, so that way uh, trudging through the subpar gameplay would be worth it. You could have just made the whole game mindless and made it shorter. You could have included more game mechanics and more moves to use to mask the fact that your game is so simple. You know, that's something that Dynasty Warriors does to great effect. Dynasty Warriors is an incredibly simple game with simple game mechanics, and the biggest reason to play Dynasty Warriors titles, the mainline ones, is that it's satisfying to kill enemies with a variety of moves all the characters have, you know? They look flashy, they're fun to do, and there's no shortage of playable characters and weapons. Let me know if you see anything resembling that here. Because that's a key difference with something like this. Although hitting things mindlessly is fun in this game, it's only fun for a short while because we only have two attacks, only one character, no compelling narrative, the music is all choppy, and I realize this is an indie game, you know? I realize it has limitations that Dynasty Warriors doesn't. That's why I suggest it should be shorter. Or just choose. Do you want to be challenging or not? Just pick one. You know, the music's choppiness is getting really insane in these later levels, so let's do something about that. Something I should mention about these barbarian enemy types is that when you're facing a whole horde of them, it's best to stand still instead of move toward them. Because it is possible to get turned around when you do that, like when you fight the wolves. It doesn't happen often, but it happens often enough that you should be wary and just stand still instead. They could have maybe mixed these guys with the porcupine enemies or some barrels or something. Even the, uh, even the bear traps from way earlier in the game would have been, sorry, animal traps from way earlier in the game would have been, uh, something. But as it stands, the whole stage is actually just like this. And normally I would edit something like this heavily, but uh... But this is the only full playthrough of the game available on the internet, so... You're gonna see the whole thing whether you like it or not. In this level we get yet another, uh, another new enemy type. This one is the Archer. And he's more like our traditional beat-em-up projectile enemy than the rock-throwing guys. Unfortunately, we can deal with every single one of them just by walking down on the bottom of the screen. Because they don't move or aim, they just stand in one spot and fire straight forward. If you actually made them move up or down or aim their shots so that way I had to actively try to avoid them, you might have something kind of difficult on your hands here. But when I got to this point the first time I completed the game, I had lost all faith. I knew that they weren't going to do anything interesting with the archer enemies, combine them in an interesting fashion with anyone else because that's just not how the game rolls. And even if they would, it's a little too late for that. It's a little bit too late in the game to make your game good spontaneously, because I have to play through the other 18 minutes of it to get here. In this next level, a few of the archer enemies will actually hit us, but for the most part they can be avoided the same way we avoided them in the previous level. It's worth noting that the attack range on our chainsaw is vastly improved from the attack range on our axe. So killing these guys is much easier than it would have been. I can't help but look at this huge wall of arrows and think, man, I was probably supposed to dodge that or something. But there's no reason to do that when I can just walk beneath it. You know, I heard once, I believe it was from people developing a Crash Bandicoot fan game. I think the game was called Crystal's Wrath or something like that, but uh... I heard from people developing a Crash Bandicoot fan game once that when you include a new element in your game, don't just use it as intended, overuse it. Spam it as much as possible in as many situations as possible. So you know, that way you'll thoroughly understand how it works. I feel like maybe this developer misunderstood. He heard the spamming part, but he didn't hear the in every situation part. It didn't mean literally fill the screen with archers. And I don't think you're supposed to leave the spamming in the final version either. Like, the point of the spamming is to figure out why and how the mechanic works and where it would be best to use it. The, the, uh, the player's not actually supposed to see the spamming. So I feel like this guy heard good advice, he just took the advice incredibly incorrectly. 
And you know that happens, miscommunication is in fact the default form of communication. It's just a shame that nobody could help him out before it got to release. Oh yeah, I guess there's a new enemy type here. Uh, the bear is basically the barbarian, only he deals even more damage than the barbarian. And we deal with him the same way as the barbarian, which is to say spamming the light attack. He actually only deals 5 more damage though. I mean, I know 20 damage is a lot of damage. But you might as well just replace the Barbarian with the bear. There's no reason to have them both. You know for you guys it's only been like 20 minutes. But in post commentary this feels like 5 eternities. With all- excuse me. With all the editing. And if I don't like a take of something I said or I think it's too loud or too quiet I redo it. So like I've been doing this shit for like 3 hours. I didn't play the game for three hours, but I did play it three times in order to get good enough to, uh, to show it off. Which may seem kind of silly in retrospect. I like that this level has shield enemies with other enemies. It's not sufficiently challenging to make the game less, uh, dull, but... I do like the shield enemies. You know, I realize the music that you're listening to right now is really repetitive, but that's intentional. Because the music in Bytown Lumberjack is really repetitive, it's the same song throughout the entire game. So the joke was to replace it with a soundtrack that was equally repetitive, but much less choppy. And also from a beat-em-up that was discussed during this video. So there you go, now you understand what I was going for. I don't do that, uh... That whole see what you want to see in my art thing, you know, I just tell people what it means. Get away from me with that. I've seen some people criticize Jonathan Blow for outright telling people what his art means, but I support that fully, as I see it, uh... As I see it, telling people what your art means is a form of punk, you know? It's a form of punk art expression, and I like punk. Now granted, not many people will look at Jonathan Blow and think, man, that dude's punk is hell, but at least I do. So this level is conspicuously entirely absent of enemies. It's just these animal traps that we saw earlier and also a bunch of logs to cut through. So yeah, even uh... Even more dull than the usual for this game. We are on level 18 though, which means there are only two more levels until the end of the game. You know, there were a few points during this recording that I considered reusing the gag that I used for Power Rangers Mega Battle, where I tried to escape from the boredom by talking about different games entirely, like MX vs. ATV. But I decided that wouldn't fit as well here. You know, with Bytown Lumberjack, there is at least some threat of dying still, unlike in Power Rangers Mega Battle. So Bytown Lumberjack doesn't deserve that, it's not as boring as Power Rangers Mega Battle. So in this level we- oh hey look. Look, a glitch, how humorous. It's really cute. Anyway, in this level they throw every enemy type at us in a huge wave. First it's the raccoons, then the humans, then the wolves, and you know, so on. This actually reminds me a little bit of the penultimate level in Final Fight, the original Final Fight. Where they had segmented waves of enemies of different types come at you. All the way up until you fight Abigail. And even though on paper the design is the same thing, in Final Fight it was much more entertaining because you tackle all the enemies in a different fashion. You know? And at the end of that level you get to fight Abigail too. You don't get to fight Abigail at the end of this level. I like fighting Abigail. Abigail is my favorite Final Fight character. Did you know Abigail is appearing in Street Fighter V? I know a lot of people aren't too happy about that, but man, I was. I remember watching a video about the Final Fight bosses, I think it was from Defunct Games, and Abigail was listed as one of the worst boss battles, and I can totally see why most people would think he's a bad boss battle, but personally, from a... From a personal taste standpoint, Abigail is my jam, both as a character and as a boss fight. Seriously, when I think of Final Fight, I think, man, that game was way too hard, and then I think, man, I love the Abigail boss fight, and Abigail's a cool character. I like to imagine that someone at Capcom saw as much potential in his story as I did, and that's why he's in Street Fighter V. 
Because Capcom fighting games and beat em ups have unusually in depth stories. Alright, it's time for the final boss battle. We are now at level 20. And we're gonna go tackle that deer. I apologize about the frame rate, by the way. That's not my fault. That is the game as well. So before we can actually fight the deer past these RPG maker looking rocks, we need to destroy another uh, legion of enemies. Even though we just did this in the previous level. So yeah, there's basically a mini level 19 in the final boss level. It's a little weird. It is missing the projectile enemies, which I guess is a small blessing. You can hear the audio getting insanely choppy here, though. I really wish it didn't do that. Anyway, about the boss itself, I want to say before we get to it, that when I fought this boss upon my first, uh, my first full run-through of the game, I actually died quite a few times and I didn't know what to do. I was really confused because he attacked super fast, and I couldn't figure out how to hit him without getting hurt. But I found a way through it. Man, the game sounds like it's fucking dying. So what do you think the solution I found was, personally? What do you think the solution was to this boss battle for me? Because I love puzzle boss battles, you know? I am so sorry that the audio is doing this. I am so sorry. Okay, moment of truth. How do we beat the final boss battle? It's fucking genius, I know. I doubt anybody but me could have ever uncovered this brilliant tactic to the final boss of Bytown Lumberjack. Oh, and by the way, did I mention the game has the audacity to end on a cliffhanger? No? Well, it's too late now. Enjoy the ending. No, there was never a sequel. Anyway, that was Bytown Lumberjack, and the other games are better. At least the ones I've played so far are, so look forward to those. <laughs>